Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. We're speaking to Dr. Imtia Suleiman, founder and chairman of Africa's largest relief aid organization, Gift of the Givers. A very warm well welcome back. And Dr. Suleiman, one of the things I said before we went to break is we're going to delve into the man behind the organization. When you started the organization in 1992, before that, you had been working in a private, um, private health care for eight and a half years. And then you decide you're not going to go that route. You're going to start Gift of the Givers. What informed that decision? In fact, I didn't decide anything. It happened. It, it was sort of trust on me. Mm -hmm. You know, they say there's a thing called a calling. It is, I, I met a spiritual teacher in Istanbul in 91. And by that stage, I was five years in medical practice already. And it's a long story, but I met him in 91. And I went back in 92 again. And I was amazed at what I saw in that spiritual place. I saw people from all religions, all countries, all colors, all types of people, just harmoniously interacting with each other. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? And the spiritual teacher at that time told me something very important. He said, you see, all of mankind is one nation. The God of all mankind is one. And we only call him by different names. And he said the important thing to understand is that all human beings feel the same pain, the same hurt, the same type of anxieties. They all call the same kind of difficulties. And then he said something very profound. He said, if any preacher, an imam, a molana, a sheikh, a rabbi, any priest, anyone promotes violence, Conflict, discord, and friction between peoples is not a man of God. Don't follow him. But if anybody preaches love, understanding, compassion, love, and kindness, follow him. He's a man of God. And I thought about that, and I came back a year later. And on 6th of August, 1992, it was a prayer night on a Thursday. After the prayer night, he just looked at me. He said, you will form an organization. The name will be Gifts of the Givers. The important thing to remember that best among people are those who benefit mankind, and you will benefit mankind, all of mankind, unconditionally. You will not expect any thanks in return. You will help people with love, with compassion, with kindness and dignity, and this is the mission for you for the rest of your life. And then he said something very profound again. He said, remember my son, that whatever is done is done through you and not by you. And don't ever remember, or don't ever forget that, that whatever is done is done through you and not by you. And as long as you stick to that idea, you know, you will learn that everything is put in front for you and you will know exactly what to do. And really, in 20 years, I know what to do. Have there been times, though, even though you, you've had this, this powerful word spoken over you and this vision you've so, you said you has been thrust into your life, have there been times, though, where you've just felt this is a bit too much and you've just felt like giving up? No. I'm a person who loves challenge, you know. And I always, we have a teaching that God does not put something in, in, uh, more than a person can bear in front of him. We have the teaching. So whatever is put is according to your capacity and your capability. And we're very strong in prayer. We know you have to take God's help in whatever you do. So whatever we do, you know, and also the projects, I don't just don't take on any projects. I mentioned to you the criteria in the beginning. But quite often, it comes like my inspiration that you should do this. And we respond. And there are lots of challenges. I won't call it difficulties. You know, there are lots of challenges. And step by step, as you overcome the challenge, you'll find that challenge was indeed a blessing because it opens up new ways for you. And you do things in a much more efficient manner. So yes, there's been lots of challenges. And you know what? I've, I've never ever found something puts me back. Because you can't allow that to happen. You always ask yourself one, one question. If I was in that condition, or if my child was in that condition, would I expect the world to say we are too tired, it's too challenging, we don't want to do anything about it? Can you imagine that? So if you can think about it for your own self, you have to think about what you would do for people, people in need. Dr. Solomon, I want to ask you this though. You go to, to these places, when, when you just started and you were talking, when you started the program, you were talking about the state of what you found when you went to the Congo. And, and we, we hear these numbers, and when you're listening to the news, you hear these numbers, but to actually be there and to see the suffering, to see the destruction, to see the utter decimation, and to see it so regularly the way that you do, how do you not get numb? In, in seeing so much of that happen and continue doing your work? I have a desire to help people all the time. Again, I relate to my family, saying, you know what, they are not in that situation. So out of gratitude, I like to respond, saying, you know what, because my family is not in that situation, I want to help people who are in that situation. So I can never say I am tired. Secondly, I don't allow myself to get emotionally involved. When I say emotionally involved, I feel compassion for an entire disaster, an earthquake hit Haiti. So I feel sorry for the people of Haiti. 
but I don't get emotionally attached to Daniel in, or, or Larato or, you know, or anybody else in Haiti. I don't get emotionally attached to that person. The moment you do that, finish its curtains for you. Mm -hmm. Because you'll break down, you won't be able to function, you'll just keep crying all the time. And that happened to some of my teams. They actually broke down after four or five days. They got too emotionally attached. And you should not allow that to happen. And what do you do for the, your team, though, when that happens and they do fall, when they do break down and they, and they do, you know, cry or, or see this? I mean, I would imagine if I were there, I would probably be one of those people that would be completely distraught and not probably not be able to work because I would just be so broken by what was happening. How do you how do you deal with that in the field? We 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 we, we talk, you know, we discuss it in groups, but of course we don't do the counselling there. When they come back, they have opportunity for trauma counselling, which we provide. But before we take them, people think I'm crazy. I tell medical personnel, I tell doctors, I tell paramedics, I, see, I talk to those who are involved in accidents and I see all the type of injuries coming back. I tell them when you go there, make sure you don't become squeamish. And they must be thinking, this is man mad. We, we, medical do people, we, we do this all the time. I said the difference is you see that in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. You see one car, two bodies, three injured people. When you go to an earthquake, you see tens of thousands of injured people, total destruction, women and women, children running in the street or nobody to help. For example, in the church, when they went to do clean up and to assist, when the child came, they had to amputate the child of the hand of the child, who was already amputated before, and suddenly before they messed it up. Now they had to cut more. When they finished, they told the child, "Go home now." And the child looked at them and asked, "What home? There is no home." So they said, "All right, go to your parents or your grandparents." And the child said, "What parents and what grandparents? There is nobody. I am alone." And they just broke down when that, when that happened. How do you? D I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm thinking, I don't even know what question to ask you next because my brain's just g gotten into a freeze. How do you deal with that? How do you then, at that moment, because there's no time for them to come back and then uh, counsel them, at that moment, what do you do? There is no counseling at an acute stage. It's just too traumatic. You know what? You take the guys and tell them, you know, have a breather, sit to the other side, and in the evening, the teams talk among themselves. Now I'm talking about my teams. I'm not talking about the other people. In that acute phase, you can't do counseling. People are worried, where's my father? When am I going to eat? Can I get medical service? What am I going to do about my house? They are worried about all those things. Counseling won't work there. They won't be interested in what you're saying. That's a phase in stage later. Exactly like now, I went to Congo on the fifth, on, on 9th of March. I went back last week, this weekend. Now the next phase is counseling. They've asked us for counseling, for trauma counselors, and we're putting together a team that will leave on the 29th of April. But when did this thing happen? On the 5th of March. Can you see the time span? Because there's total flux between camps. One day you're in this camp, then you're in the next camp, then you're moving around, then you're looking for your house, then you're looking for your son or your child. 75 children are missing. You know, they found 28 in different camps. So if you are focusing on that kind of stuff, you can't focus on counseling. Mm -hmm. And you, you only have to have continuity. So it, counseling has to be done at a later stage. Like in Pakistan, we send in spinal rehab teams after the initial phase for orthopedic injuries and spinal injuries. So there are phases in what you do and how you do it. I want to talk a little bit about education. That's something that you're very passionate about. And um, it, it, it seems as though I was reading something where y your organization had do donated about 1.3 million to the University of KwaZulu-Natal, if, if I'm correct. Um, just talk to us a little bit about, about what you would like to see Gift of the Givers involved in when it comes to education. Because I know with, with this particular donation that you gave, you gave it was primarily for the agriculture um, schools in that, in that university. Africa needs to develop. It needs to develop skills, it needs education, and it needs agriculture. 70% of the economy of this continent is dependent on agriculture. We don't need high-tech stuff. Because we import high-tech machines, nobody knows how to fix it, nobody knows how to repair it. You need simple involvement in agriculture. And we want to reactivate the faculty of agriculture, get students interested. Because in the last few years, agriculture is not fashionable. It's mm -hmm. something done by the past by people. Now they said Afrikaner farmers, the apartheid people did agriculture. They have that kind of mentality. But we need agriculture in Africa. Mm -hmm. So we gave them a grant to stimulate and bring kids back. But besides that, we do bursaries. We started in 97 with 20,000 rand bursaries. We now do 6 million rand a year on bursaries. Because if kids are not educated, they cannot make progress. Edu edu education is a means of empowerment. People become entrepreneurs. They develop, they, we have skills, and each skilled person creates jobs for other people. And we even started something else, a special program, we may not have time to talk about this now, a computer program called Jumpstart, where we give three kids in school in standard uh, grade, like the new old system, like grade mm. 10, grade 11, and grade 12, where we teach them, you know, how to give them a logo, 
the value of branding, the value of marketing, how they can promote themselves. We give them a web page, letter heads, business cards, and we just started this pilot program last mm -hmm. year. In December alone, one of those kids we selected made 15,000 in profit from one of the projects itself. And we've doubled and invested five million in the project already. But it's all education and IT related in that case, agriculture and education in the other case, ag education in general with bursaries, and education for the schools where we support them with stationery, with books, with libraries, with computers, with sports equipment, with food, and a whole range of things that we do. Mm -hmm. One of the things you've been accredited has been developing the Suicide So Ready Food Supplement, which, which is, you know, uh, when I was just reading some of the articles and, and just how much it's how much is in it and how it's changing some communities that it has been uh, distributed in where do you find the time <laughs> i want to talk a little bit about it but where do you find the time to even take away from this and be able to develop a product like this i didn't develop it you know what i, I, I again I, the, the formula was put into my brain on a friday morning on the 16th of april 2004. i did some nutrition lectures in medical school i didn't go to all of them i haven't been in practice since 94. And that I was in practice only for eight and a half years as a GP. So really, to design a nutrition formula has to be some kind of a spiritual gift. You know? And my teacher told me in 1999, you'll be involved in food. He passed on then. And he told me you'd be involved in food. I didn't know what he was talking about. And in 2004, I understood then what he was talking about. And this formula came in my head that Africa's problems is low weight, lack of iodine, lack of iron, lack of protein, lack of calcium, and issues generally in terms of nutrition. And although I mean, we re rolled out food parcels you know, of the highly branded products in the country. People still, they were not hungry, but they made no progress in terms of their health. And this product came, the world's first, again developed in Africa. Groundnut, soya combination, what a pre-mix, preservative free, doesn't require water to mix, doesn't require heating, doesn't require cooking, doesn't require refrigeration. In the case of disaster or hardship and difficulty, you just throw the bottle from the helicopter, people open it, and it's energy dense and nutrient dense, mm. meaning that one spoon is very potent in terms of the energy it supplies and the nutrients it supplies. But I don't want to take credit for that. Dr. Sidema, <laughs> there's so much, it's like you were saying, half an hour just flies fast. Thank you so much for joining us. The absolute inspiration listening to you speak and wish you well and the organization very well. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, that was Dr. Imtiaz Suleiman, founder and chairman of Gift of the Givers, Africa's largest relief aid organization. Have a good evening. Good night.